today on another episode of the Danville Discussion. It must be so cool to be in the circus. Yeah. Hey, Verb, let's put on our own cirque. This will be great. Verb can set up the tent. I'll be the ringmaster. We can sew up some arty costumes. Hey, poor trick, I can put my leg over my head. Ow. I'll work on it. Even Perry can have an act. The amazing Perry. Oh, I have a mystical, magical act I would like to perform. It's stupefying. I have another act that will bring the house down. Verb, get the tools. Let's do this. Hey. Discussion, a podcast about all things related to Phineas and Ferb and beyond. I'm your host, Caleb Dirksen, and some of you may know me from my YouTube channel of the same name, which features some web series related to animation such as Caleb Reviews. If this is your first visit with the Danville Discussion, well, the title says everything. This is a podcast where I talk about shows set in the Dan Povemeyer universe, aka the Dan and Swampy universe, aka the Dwampyverse. Specifically going through each episode of either Phineas and Ferb or Hamster and Gretel and searching for everything to analyze including, but not limited to, cultural or in-universe references and fun facts. And then finally I will end things off by giving each episode a roller coaster rating. So now, for today's episode, I'm going to be analyzing episode 8 of Phineas and Ferb which contains the two segments, Jerk This Away and Toy to the World. If you want to check out more episodes of the Danville Discussion, then head on over to Anchor, which has just been renamed Spotify for Podcasters, so now you can go over to podcasters.spotify.com slash show slash pod slash Caleb dash Dirksen, and then it'll take you directly to the Danville Discussion website over there. You can also share your feedback or ask some questions you may have about this episode by emailing us at danvilledescussion at gmail.com. That's D-A-N-V-I-L-L-E-D-I-S-C-U-S-S-I-O-N, in all lowercase, at gmail.com, with the series and episode title in the subject line. And now, before we begin, let's look at the air dates for these segments. So, Jerk to Soleil first premiered on Disney Channel on Sunday, February 10th, 2008, and was the 12th episode in broadcast order. While Toy to the World premiered on Disney Channel on Friday, February 22nd of that year and was the 16th episode in broadcast order. So, the first segment that I will talk about is Jerk the Soleil. And Jerk the Soleil was a story by Bobby Gaylor and Martin Olsen, storyboarded by J.G. Quintel and Kim Roberson, and directed by Dan Povemeyer. In this one, Baljeet arrives at the Flynn Fletcher house as Phineas, Ferb, Isabella, Django, and Buford are eating breakfast, and Lawrence, who is Phineas and Ferb's dad, plans to take the boys and their friends to the Cirque de Lune, but then it shows in the morning newspaper that the circus was cancelled due to the lead of the show having a severe allergic reaction and being unable to perform and their mother, Linda, is sympathetic to the lead of the show because she knows how bad allergies are. Plus, Candace has a horrible allergy to wild parsnips. Linda is also excited because this means her husband is free to be at the Googleplex Mall when her jazz trio records its first album, Live at the Squat and Stitch. When Isabella muses that it must be fun to be in the circus, Phineas gets an idea for the day that they'll make a backyard cirque and each have a part of the act. Ferb can set up the tent, Phineas will be the ringmaster, Isabella and the Fireside Girls can sew up the costumes, and Perry will have an act as the Amazing Perry. Baljeet, Django, and Buford will round out the cirque. They all have talents where Baljeet can remove his finger and hold it in his hand with no injuries. Django can lift his leg over his head but is currently not very skilled, succeeding only in pulling off his shoe and sock and I assume they might have been glued together. And Buford's talent is to bounce to the heavens and land in mud. 
Speaking of Django Brown, this is also the first time where he actually speaks, and he was originally voiced by Alec Holden. Hey, word trick, I can put my leg over my head. Ow. I'll work on it. So the tent very quickly rises in the backyard, which leaves Candace interrupted from her daydreaming of Jeremy to the point that she has to try and bust the boys once again, and everyone has put together their costumes already, including Perry, who has disappeared for his assignment from Major Monogram still in costume. Major Monogram is very amused by Agent P's costume and starts laughing at Perry. Not wanting to listen to it, Perry leaves for his mission, but Major Monogram convinces him to turn around one last time and he snaps a picture of the platypus. In the backyard, Buford arrives with his props and his goal is to fly through the air with a paper bag on his head into mud. Hey twerp, I brought the props for my act. Buford, what exactly is your act? I fly into mud with a paper bag on my head. Okay then. The peeps are gonna love. Candace walks back to the tent to see what's going on and reluctantly calls Linda when she hears an elephant, but Linda blows her off since she's recording and Candace gets even more frustrated about this when Jeremy shows up with a basket of vegetables from his mother's garden, which actually turn out to be wild parsnips. Starting to get red and blotchy and her voice getting funny, Jeremy asks her to sit with him at the cirque. Meanwhile, at Doofenshmirtz's lair, Dr. Doofenshmirtz is using a self-help tape to try and become more assertive. He hates his high squeaky voice and wants to make it lower. However, the tape isn't working out so well, just as Perry bursts through the ceiling and the evil doctor quickly traps him. Doof then reveals the Voicinator, a machine that biomechanically transforms regular air into Doofelium, which will make everyone else's voice higher, making his voice lower by comparison because it was too much trouble making his own voice lower. Hence that Doofelium is a portmanteau of Doofenshmirtz and Helium. Back at the Flynn Fletcher house, Candace rushes for allergy pills, only to find out that she's run out, and now her voice has become deep with her face turning hot pink, and she wears a gray hoodie and a paper bag over her head to disguise and hide herself from Jeremy while going out to find Linda. But you want to know who provided Candace's deep voice from that allergy? While Candace herself is voiced by Ashley Tisdale, her deep voice was done by Dan Povenmire, and honestly, after watching Milo Murphy's Law, I realized that her deep voice sounds a lot like Vinnie Dakota, who Dan voiced in that show. Like, now that I think about it, Dan does a fantastic job doing a deep, gruff voice when doing Dakota and allergy-affected Candace. No, no. Mindy can't sit with Jeremy. Gotta stop this. Gotta tell Mom. Can't go out looking like this. Pass it all. I told you to ride the brakes. Not good on the disc. Yeah, well, it's not good on the front of the car to hit a brick wall. Ah, there it is. But wait one moment. Meanwhile, Perry escapes from Duke's lair and uses his copter to follow him. He flies over the circus and hears his act being announced and swoops down to show up to the act. There, Baljeet is performing his act, which is pretending to separate his thumb from his hand. And then Perry's act is up next, where Ferb drops him onto a trampoline. He bounces through a hoop and into a shallow pool. When this is over, Perry changes back into his hat and hops onto his copter to find Doofenshmirtz. Candace arrives at the squad and Stitch, where Linda and her trio is performing, complaining about her brothers in a musical fashion by singing Evil Boys. Those boys are evil. Let me spell it out for you, Mom. E-V-I-L-B-O-Y-S. After that, Candace returns to the Cirque to sit with Jeremy, just as the flying through the air with a paper head bag act comes on. Since Candace wore a paper bag and a jogging suit, she is mistaken for Buford as they are both wearing the same clothes and Candace is standing under a spotlight and is shot out of the tent instead of Buford, but Buford jumps into the mud to get the glory, which makes Phineas wonder how Buford got there so quickly. Back to the doctor, he and Perry are still fighting. He breaks the controller, which lands in the boys' cirque during the whole cast part, which makes the cast members' voices higher. 
After the performance, the cheering gets higher because of the voiceinator and blows the tent off, hitting the voiceinator and making Doofenshmirtz's voice even higher. Linda and Lawrence arrive home to show Phineas and Ferb their new CD. Meanwhile, Candace, with her skin and voice back to normal, finally makes it back to the house. Jeremy picks her up and asks how she got her voice so deep for her song, and Candace responds that she got her voice like all the other blue singers through Wild Parsnips, and that concludes Jerk This Away. Hey, Candace. My mom played me some of their CD. Your singing is awesome. How'd you get your voice to sound like that? Oh, same as all the great blue singers. Wild Parsnips. For the cultural references I was able to find, the title of this episode is a play on the famous Cirque du Soleil, and even the Cirque du Loon is based off of that. In English, Cirque du Soleil translates to Circus of the Sun, and Cirque du Loon translates to Circus of the Moon. I've never actually been to the Cirque du Soleil before, but I do see the aesthetic displayed in this episode with the costumes and everything. When we go to Doofenshmirtz's lair, you'll notice an image of a red Triforce somewhere. The Triforce is a fictional artifact and icon of the Legend of Zelda video game series by Nintendo. Although I don't normally play as much Zelda as I do Mario, I do recognize the Triforce by its three triangles alone with nothing in the middle. Next, when Baljeet does his thumb act, he says feel the rhythm, feel the rhyme, Come on, Thumb, it's healing time, which is a reference to the line Feel the Rhythm, Feel the Rhyme from the 1993 film Cool Runnings, which I have not seen yet. For the song Evil Boys, Candace sings about her troubles with Phineas and Ferb, which is exactly what Chris Parker does when she and the kids try to run away from the bad guys in Adventures in Babysitting, the 1987 film by Touchstone Pictures, not the Disney Channel original movie that came eight years after this episode aired. And I don't think I've seen either one yet, even though I've heard the name. And when Dr. Doofenshmirtz uses his voiceinator after Candace gets launched out of the tent and Perry rushes to the circus, Phineas's voice gets higher to the point that he ends up speaking like the Chipmunks. You know, Alvin and the Chipmunks? I grew up with the Alvin and the Chipmunks franchise as a kid. Whether it be watching stuff like the 1980s cartoon on Teletoon Retro, or the Chipmunk Adventure from my DVD, or their Halloween movies like Alvin and the Chipmunks Meet Frankenstein, or Alvin and the Chipmunks Meet the Wolfman on YTV. But those are just the cartoons, the live-action films I may have grown up with, but looking at them now, along with many of their reviews... Yeah, I better not talk about those films. I hate those movies are garbage, honestly. Best for me to just stick with the cartoons. But for the last cultural reference, the last line that Candace says in this episode is explaining that she got her deep, raspy voice the same way that many blue singers get their voice by being allergic to wild parsnips. But this is a hardly subtle reference to the fact that most blue singers smoke to get their raspy tone. And now, for some more handy tools out of my big toolbox of Jerk This Away supplies, aka my fun facts, J.G. Quintel, one of the storyboarders of this episode, also went on to create regular show for Cartoon Network and close enough for HBO Max. So, if it wasn't for his involvement with this show, we wouldn't have had regular show in the first place, so thank you, J.G. Quintel. In this episode, Perry's food bowl was black, but it changed to red in a later episode, Oh There You Are Perry. This episode also has a book adaptation called Big Top Bonanza. The Cirque is one of the more impossible ideas that Phineas and Ferb have, where in the grand finale, the brothers appear in four different places at the same time as their human pyramid is panning up. In fact, for less than a second, you could notice two copies of them in the same shot at once. I'm guessing they made clones of themselves because if they alone had moved from their original positions in order to climb to the very top, the pyramid would have fallen over, at least to my assumption. 
Also, I believe this is in production order, but Phineas' normal voice for the rest of the show is more noticeable beginning with this episode, as his voice actor Vincent Martella was going through puberty, so he doesn't sound as much like your average 10 year old like he did back in Roller Coaster. Among the Fireside Girls who dressed up in their blue circus outfits, there are a couple additional members who appear alongside the regular members. In most foreign dubs, when Doofenshmirtz yells his iconic curse to Perry, his voice isn't affected by the Dufilium, probably because the translators forgot to pitch bend his voice up high. In fact, I'll play a sample of that in French and compare that with the original version. Yeah, I can tell that the French dubbers didn't pitch Ben Duke's voice higher when he said that. If you want to know what that means, Pierre-Francois Pistorio, who is the French voice of Dr. Doofenshmirtz, said Soi-maudit Perry l'onitalink, which basically means Curse you Perry the Platypus in French. Now, anyways, when I was watching this episode on Disney+, Plus, I spotted a caption error on that platform in which Phineas is asking where Perry is, and he says, Have you seen Perry? I put on his costume. But the caption on Disney+, Plus misreads as, I put him his costume. I don't know why it's like that, but whatever. And the other milestones include that this is the second time Phineas and Ferb deliberately clean up their work following one known beach party of terror, though the net flew away whilst the rest was cleaned up by Ferb as he pulled a lever, hiding the audience seats underground. It's also the first time that Perry gets involved in both his mission and Phineas and Ferb's big idea at the same time. The first time Isabella wears a ponytail, or pigtails in this case because her hair was going through both sides on her circus outfit. It was also the first and also one of the only two appearances of Mindy, the girl who flirted with Jeremy while Candace was running off to get Linda. In this episode, she's voiced by Ashley Teasdale, and Mindy's other appearance was in Hail Dufania later this season, but in that one, she's voiced by Allison Stoner. And lastly, this is the first time that Isabella reads the newspaper. She would read it again in Phineas and Ferb Christmas Vacation and The Beak. Jumping on to the pros and cons, let's get to what I like. First off, when all the kids decide what they want to do for Phineas and Ferb Circus, I kind of chuckled when Django told them what he wanted to do for his act and attempted to put his leg on his head, but he ended up falling out of the chair he was in and only grabs his sock and shoe. Of course he'll get better at it. Speaking of whom, I like that Django is one of the main kids in this episode, and I wish I got more of him with the rest of the kids in the show. Maybe it could happen with the revival? I'll never know. I think I'd like to call the group of Phineas, Ferb, Isabella, Buver, Balji, and Django the Summer Six, the same way that Mickey and Minnie Mouse, Donald and Daisy Duck, Goofy and Pluto are the Sensational Six, and Twilight Sparkle, Pinkie Pie, Rainbow Dash, Applejack, Rarity, and Fluttershy from My Little Pony Friendship is Magic are the main six. But if you would include Candace or Irving, it would be the Summer Seven, and if it's both, then it would be the Extreme Eight? But other than that, it would still be the Summer Six with Irving or Candace instead of Django, and if none of them are part of it, then it would just be the Fundamental Five. But the next thing that I liked was when Candace is in bed and she's playing with her photos of herself and Jeremy, and she's pretending that Jeremy is there with her, and I thought that was cute. <sighs> Good morning, Jeremy. Good morning, gorgeous. Oh, chair. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be right back, Jeremy. Then we have the Where's Perry gag where, of course, Phineas says something slightly different and unique with that question with, Hey, have you seen Perry? And the second time he says it is combined with the Oh, There You Are Perry gag when Perry comes back to the circus the first time. I kind of like it when two running gags are combined into one. Also, Buford's act plan is just silly to me where he plans to fly into mud 
with a paper bag on his head, and then Phineas pauses for a few seconds before responding that he's okay with it. And what's funny too is how Candace gets inside the tent after Django's human pretzel wax and at the moment when it's time for the amazing Bago, and Phineas mistakes Candace for that role instead of Buford because they're both wearing a gray hoodie and a paper bag with some face visors cut out, which might draw some confusion to Phineas. And after they launch Candace out of the tent, Buford, who jealously caught her taking over his act, finishes it off for her by jumping in the mud pit himself, and then Phineas wonders how he got down there, thinking the brothers launched Buford when in reality, they launched Candace. And we have Ferb's line where Ferb replies, perhaps Buford is truly amazing. No, no, this is Buford's moment to shine. Hey, everybody, over here. Wait, how'd he get down there? Then perhaps Buford truly is amazing. And then we also have what I would say is not only the highway of the main plot, but also the biggest highway of this episode, which is the song that Candace performs with Linda's jazz group, Evil Boys. It's a highly catchy blues number that even reminds me of George Thorogood's Bad to the Bone, where the allergy-affected, deep-voiced Candace explains to Linda how Phineas and Ferb have been quote-unquote ruining her life with their summer activities. They built a roller coaster and a beach in the backyard, drove cattle through the city and messed up the boulevard. This even brings up some more handy tools that I have about it. This song ended up being voted number 6 on the Phineas and Ferb musical clip task the countdown in season 2. Some of the lyrics that Candace sings mention the events of It's About Time and Tree to Get Ready, meaning that this episode takes place after those episodes, and this one came after them in production order, even if it was aired before them at the time. For instance, she mentions the roller coaster from Roller Coaster, the beach in the backyard from Lawn Elm Beach Party of Terror, the cattle in the city from The Magnificent Few, the time machine from It's About Time, and the treehouse robots from Tree to Get Ready. Going on to the Perry and Doofenshmirtz subplot, while not quite as long as the main plot in this episode, it was still hilarious, and that's where the rest of my highlights come in. First off, Perry, in his costume, takes an elevator hidden under the lawn, and when he gets to his lair, Major Monogram briefs Agent P's mission when he sees Perry's costume, and he just laughs at his look, and takes a picture to send to Carl through email. That part was just so funny. Okay, Agent P. Dr. Doofenshmirtz is buying biomechanical equipment and <laughs> elocution tapes. <laughs> we don't know why. Where, where are you going, Agent P? Wait, 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 wait. Don't, don't go. I'm, I'm not laughing at you. I just heard a funny joke earlier this morning. And please, please, Agent P, turn around so we can conclude our meeting. <laughs> Carl, 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 what's your email? Oh, I'm gonna send this to you. <laughs> then when it cuts to Dr. Doof trying to lower his voice with his Tough Talk audio tape, Perry breaks into the lair, and Dr. D advises Perry to use the front door from now on, where a bunch of traps are. I love that first scene with him. I'm dancing with your wife, pal. You got a problem with that? I'm dancing. <clears throat> I'm dancing with your wife, pal. You got a problem with that? Oh, yes, that does sound tough. Yeah, I ate your last nectarine. You got a problem with that? Yes, I ate... <laughs> Barry the platypus, look, could, could you just use the front door from now on? Could you just do that for me? I mean, <clears throat> yes, I ate your last nectarine. You got a problem with that? Sounds tough, huh? But not tough enough. Plus, another thing I like was Perry's multitasking between his mission and his acts when he goes between the circus tent and Doof's lair. The one minor con I have with this episode in general is that one time, Django's name in the closed captions, namely on Disney+, Plus, is misspelled as Django without a D at the beginning. So it sort of sounds like Django Fett from Star Wars. I'm looking at you, caption guys. Jumping to the animation for the pros and cons, both this segment and the other one were animated by Rough Draft Korea, and for this segment, it looks decent for the most part. 
For the pros, I always mention that the animation can get really smooth sometimes, where it would go up to 24 frames per second, and that the special effects are pretty good. But also, the facial expressions can get more cartoony sometimes rather than how Dan would usually draw his mouth with all the geometry and stuff like that. I even love the usage of squash and stretch, such as when Candace comes home and turns to the tent. The circus tent looks very colorful and vibrant both inside and out with all the pinks and violets, the triangles, and even a bit of shading for more texture. I also like the glow on Jeremy's head outline when Candace looks at him like a hottie, along with his hair animation. And the best thing about it is the choreography during the song Evil Boys, when Candace is rocking out and the Squat and Stitch customers are dancing in their chairs while they're knitting. And I gotta say, for Mindy, she does look kinda cute in her design, like with the short blonde hair and the hair clip and her lips and her colorful shirt and everything, and I wish she appeared in more episodes with the rest of the teens and not just the two that she was in. But now, regarding my critiques with the animation, I noticed how the line art can look sharp or rough at times, and some of the animation can get stiff at certain points, plus at the end of the episode, Phineas's mouth was held on the ooh when he said, ooh I do. Also, when Candace is in bed and she hands a photo of her next to the photo of Jeremy, her arm moves stiffly. It is more noticeable when watching in widescreen because the episode was propped to pan and scan on its original TV airing and the Days of Summer DVD, and I too noticed that myself because I was watching this in widescreen on Disney+. Plus. Once again, there were some errors that I was able to spot in the visuals. For some of these, at the beginning of the episode, Balji enters the house from the front door, but when he goes inside, it looks like he's going through the kitchen door as Buford is standing next to the countertop, and Phineas, Ferb, Isabella, and Django are eating their cereal. They could have had him go past the living room too because that's where the front door is. In the same indoor shot, Balji's eyebrows disappear when he said, I am here and ready to go to the world famous Cirque de Lune, and the skull eyes on Buford's shirt were transparent, so you could actually see through his body. And right after the title of the episode fades away, when Phineas blinks, the wall behind the top of his left eye is visible. This is one of those blink and you'll miss it situations, so... You might want to pause at the correct time to spot the error since it only goes for one frame. Then, when it first cuts to Candace in bed, she's wearing her normal clothes, but in the second shot, she's in her pajamas. During the song, the guitar that Linda plays is obviously a bass, and you can tell it is if it has four strings and knobs. And lastly, when Duke's voiceinator ride flies away along with the tent, it flies above Maple Drive, and somehow the Flynn Fletcher house looks a little different and is placed somewhere else, where none of the circus participants are there anymore. I think they could have zoomed in past the Flynn Fletcher house. Overall, it's not the greatest, but it is still a great episode, and I got to see Django be one of the main kids. Something that I felt deserved to be expanded upon for more episodes. Now our next segment, let's move on to Toy to the World. And Toy to the World was a story by Bobby Gaylor and Martin Olsen. It was storyboarded by Michael Diedrich and Chong Lee. And it was directed by Jeff Swampy Marsh. In this episode, Candace has just been hired at the Hardy Hard Toy Company store in the Google Plex Mall across from Mr. Slushy Dog, where Jeremy works. While she's talking to Stacy on her cell phone about how cute Jeremy will think she is, her boss has her wear a shimmy jimmy hat, the featured hat of the store, and Jeremy notices. As she ducks away from him, Phineas and Ferb come over with their mom and check out the store, and then Candace shows them one of the Shimmy Jimmy toys. Phineas thinks that it would get old real quick, and Candace says sarcastically, like you could make a better toy, giving Phineas an idea of what they should do today. Let me introduce you boys to Shimmy Jimmy, the must-have toy of the century. It's totally awesome. Seems like that would get old real quick. Oh, like you geniuses can make a better toy. I know what we're doing today. While Ferb works on a project in the background, 
Phineas states that they should create a toy so stupidly simple, so basically bland, so idiotically uncomplicated that it could do almost anything. Ferb whistles to Phineas to show him what he made just as Phineas asks where Perry went. Meanwhile, Perry goes over a wall of fasteners in the hardware store and pulls on a bag in the display, which then turns around and Perry is in his lair with his fedora on. Major Monogram tells him that Dr. Doofenshmirtz has been stealing bricks from all over the Tri-State area. His mission is to stop him. At the Hardy Har Toy Company, the staff and board members are having a meeting about how their sales have plummeted, that kids are losing interest in climbing toys, and that they need a fresh new toy. Suddenly, Phineas and Ferb burst in with a cart and reveal their Perry in action figure, which does absolutely nothing and can be anything you want it to be. The boss likes the idea, puts them both in charge, and shows them the factory, which Phineas comments is boring and decides to give it a makeover. Speaking of the boss, JB, the CEO of Hardy Har, is voiced by J.K. Simmons, who's best known for playing J. Jonah Jameson in pretty much anything with Spider-Man, whether it be the Sam Raimi film trilogy or the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and I also know him for voicing Mayor Lionheart in Utopia. Hold on there. Aren't you a bit young to be toy designers? Well, I don't think so. So the workers have fancy clothes to wear, where they now look like Santa's elves, and the factory is made to look much more fun and colorful. The Perry and action figures are shipped out in trucks, while the marketing employee shows Phineas and Ferb posters of Perry in different themes, one being a secret agent. Not far from the toy factory, Perry arrives at Doofenshmirtz's annex facility, where a large amount of bricks are being loaded onto a truck. And as we pan to the annex, we have another variation of the evil jingle, where they say Doofenshmirtz Evil Annex. Doofenshmirtz Evil Annex! Over there, Perry gets caught in a brick trap and Dr. Doofenshmirtz approaches, explaining that he plans on constructing a great wall around the tri-state area. The only way people would be able to get in and out is through his toll booth, so it's not necessarily in the same way as Donald Trump during his presidency, because that guy has proven to be much more evil than Doof. Back at the Hardy Har store in the mall, Candace is forced to wear a platypus suit, and she hopes that Jeremy won't see her in the ridiculous costume, but he does and says that it was hard to even know if she was a girl. Afterwards, Candace sees on the news that within a few hours, Perry the in-action figure, the toy made by Phineas and Ferb, has gone worldwide, and then she calls her mom, but Linda is waiting in line for exchanges. Perry escapes from his brick trap since there was no cement to keep the bricks together and chases Dr. Doofenshmirtz on the roof, but Do falls from a skylight and into a box of Perry in action figures, and when he realizes he's surrounded by them, he freaks out and falls into a box about to be shipped. Perry comes through the skylight to look for him, but lands right in front of Phineas and Ferb who stare at him in momentary shock. Because Perry is holding still in his Agent P attire, Phineas picks him up, thinking it's one of the figures the marketing employee suggested, and tosses him in a dumpster. So first, I think the sales projections are- Hey people, I thought we agreed we weren't gonna do this. How many times do I have to say it? He's a platypus, they don't do anything. After the brothers leave, Perry jumps out and hears Duke's voice saying, Curse you Perry the platypus. Unable to locate where it came from, he leaves in a helicopter, convinced his mission is over, and then Dr. Doof, trapped in a box, is loaded onto a ship and set off across the ocean. JD asks Phineas and Ferb what toy they want to design next, but Phineas states that they're going home because their mom is making fried chicken for supper and that they're done for the day. After they leave, the employees find a brick that was imported into the office and decide to make a toy out of the brick next, but not like the Lego brand. The brick toy soon hits the market and gets its very own commercial which Phineas and Ferb see and think is a very silly and ridiculous toy idea, where Phineas asks, 
who would buy a brick for a toy? And then Ferb remarks, it does absolutely nothing. And that wraps up Toy to the World, no pun intended. And now let's go through most of the cultural references. First, the episode's title is a play on the song Joy to the World by Three Dog Night. No, 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 not the Christmas Carol, but the song with the opening lyrics, Jeremiah was a bullfrog. At the beginning of the episode, one of the little girls dancing in the Shimmy Jimmy commercial almost resembles Lilo from Disney's Lilo and Stitch, which is one of my favorite Disney animated films of the 2000s, and I even grew up with the TV series based on the movie. As for the Hardy Hard Toy Company, the name and its hyena mascot could be a spoof of the character Hardy Har Har the Hyena from the Hanna-Barbera series Lippy the Lion and Hardy Har Har. One of the climbing toys that Hardy Har has is Ascendant Brendan, a gorilla that climbs a building in reference to the famous scene in the classic film King Kong. When Ferb tangos with Perry the in action figure, he hums the first few bars of the Uruguayan tango number La Cumparsita, and for a double reference, the way the CEO eliminates the worker who thinks that Phineas and Ferb's idea won't work is reminiscent of the way that the James Bond supervillain Ernst Starvo Biofield dispatches an underling who has failed him, and also how Dr. Evil also dispatches comrades that fail him in the Austin Powers films. Back on to James Bond, I mentioned how Perry as Agent P draws inspiration from Bond himself, Agent 007, but another reference to that is Perry flying to the Doofenshmirtz Annex in a gyrocopter like Little Nelly from the 007 movie, You Only Live Twice. And here's a really big one. When Phineas and Ferb are giving the factory a makeover, we have a lot of references to Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. The purple suit that Phineas wears is a closer match to the suit worn by Gene Wilder as Willy Wonka in the 1971 film. The factory has a chocolate river, and the Badinka Dinks are a reference to the Oompa Loompas in the movie. And while the workers are dressed in outfits resembling Santa's elves, some of their outfits have colors similar to the color that Kermit the Frog has in the Muppets franchise. After one of the workers shows the mad marauding marsupial of death, even though platypi are monotremes and not marsupials, the brothers are dressed as Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, respectively. When the CEO shows off his so-called new suit near the end of the shower of appraisal, somebody says, suits you, sir, as heard in the Taylor sketches of the Fast Show, if you remember that BBC sketch comedy, I have not heard of it until now. And at the end of the episode, the advertising of a brick as a children's toy is similar to the popular toy log from the Ren and Stimpy show. Now, regarding that show, I'm just going to say this. I have occasionally watched and found the Nickelodeon Ren and Stimpy show okay in the past, but that doesn't mean I like its creator John Chris Falusi at all, and the less said about the scummy bag he did outside of the show, the better. And that also doesn't mean I like Ren and Stimpy adult party cartoon, I already reviewed that in the past, I still hate that spin-off, and it's still the worst animated series I've ever seen at the moment, especially with how much of a horrible, unlikable, and even scary character it turned Ren into with Ren Seek's help. But even at that, I'm not very proud of it. I kind of regret some of the things I said in that review, and a few other visual elements in there. Thankfully, my reviews have improved over the years since then. But enough of all that, let's not change the subject any further, as I dig out some more handy tools out of my big toolbox of Toy to the World supplies. This was the first episode to be directed by Jeff Swampy Marsh. This episode shows that Phineas is left-handed, but in a later episode, don't even blink, he is revealed to be ambidextrous, meaning he is both left-handed and right-handed. Of course, Perry didn't remove his fedora or his disguise in front of the boys because they thought he was a toy. For the Spot the Diff Marathon, the episode became toy to you and me after Dr. Doofenshmirtz used his change in Nader on it, 
Monogram makes a mistake while briefing Agent P. He says that convicts are escaping the zoo, even though the photo displays a prison. But this mistake was likely done as a joke because Monogram said that animals are rioting a few seconds earlier. In this episode, Duke says, I hope I'm not on a boat because I get seasick, which contradicts the episode interview with a platypus where he has no idea what a boat is, hence the bow act. However, this is from season 1 and the latter is from season 2, so it's the other way around. The elevator music version of Gitchy Gitchy Goo can be heard in the background while Phineas and Ferb are making the Perry toy in the hardware store at Google Plex Mall. What we need is a toy so stupidly simple, so basically bland, so idiotically uncomplicated, that it can do absolutely anything. Hmm, say, where's Perry? Remodeling the factory and updating the employee uniforms is one of the few big ideas that is not destroyed by Dr. Doofenshmirtz at the end of the episode. It even reveals that Candace's salary is under minimum wage. Ferb speaks more frequently in this episode than he normally does in most episodes, where he whistles when calling Phineas during construction of the toy, makes various noises when demonstrating what to do with the Perry in action figure, and sings his tango while dancing with the Perry in action figure, aside from saying that the brick toy does absolutely nothing. And this has also been the case with Ready for the Bettys, It's a Mud 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 World, The Wizard Whisperer, Summer Belongs to You, and both movies with Across the Second Dimension and Candace Against the Universe, the latter being the most that he's ever spoken. Ferb and the secretary are seen wearing three different sets of clothes, while Phineas goes through four, including their normal clothes, the new elf-like employee uniform for Ferb and the secretary, a clown outfit for the secretary, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. John Watson for both of the respective brothers, and a purple Willy Wonka suit for Phineas, most of which I've mentioned. During the commercial for Perry the Inaction Figure, 16 different backgrounds are shown, and the commercial makes note that the backgrounds are not included with the toy. The backgrounds include purple, pink, and green stars, a western picture with a cowboy on a horse at the top of a mezza, which could be a reference to the Magnificent Few, a fashion show catwalk which might be a reference to Runaway Runaway, an episode that I'll talk about later in this podcast, an ice fishing space, a room with randomly shaped rectangles in shades of purple, the sandy beach in the boys' backyard, a possible reference to one known beach party of terror, a desert background reminiscent of Arches National Park in Utah, then there's Phineas and Ferb's bedroom, the boys' backyard in front of their tree, a field of flowers with a huge rainbow, a jungle with a snake in a tree, the ski resort from Swinter, a blue background with overlapping blue ovals and the ever-present triangles, the Mr. Slushy Burger stand in the Danville Woods, the surface of the moon with the triangle pattern, and the United States flag. For the other milestones, this was the first appearance of Balthazar Horowitz, where he's seen at the party hard store buying a Perry in action figure. It was also the first usage of the Quirky Worky song, the first episode where Monogram calls Agent P by his real name, Perry, the first episode in production order that doesn't feature Isabella Balgi and Buford even cameo-wise, the first time Candace wears a platypus costume, as she wears it again in Perry Lays an Egg, and the second time Phineas denies that he is too young to be doing whatever he's doing after Flop Stars. So now for the pros and cons I have, beginning with what I liked, the Shimmy Jimmy jingle was pretty nice and kinda silly, especially that line, better watch what he's throwing, he ain't wearing no pants, like he's only wearing a blue and yellow striped shirt, and with his big eyes, he kind of reminds me partially of Diddy Kong from Donkey Kong Country. Shimmy Jimmy! He can climb up a tree in nothing flat, grab a ride coconut and shimmy right back. He's a real wild monkey, he can swing and dance, better watch what he's throwing, he ain't wearing no pants. Shimmy Jimmy! Shimmy Jimmy! Man, this monkey is the coolest toy around. Shimmy Jimmy! 
And the first thing I thought was kind of funny was when Candace introduces her brothers to Shimmy Jimmy as the must-have toy of the century in a monotone manner, and then Phineas believes that it would get old really quick. Funny enough, it's not exactly clear what Candace wants to achieve by busting her brothers in this episode, as it's not very dangerous or over the top for boys like them that are the exact same age as them to invent a successful toy like Perry the Inaction Figure, and that's something else I find unique about this episode. Next, I also like that they did a little variation on the two young line once again in which Phineas denies this. Like I said, he said that he wasn't too young to be a toy designer, and I love the tricks that Ferb does with the Perry toy with him pretending to do different things with it and his tango with it. Now it can be anything we want, like an airplane or a race car, or maybe a fucking Bronco. <laughs> He can even turn a mean tango. Just a minute. Even the quirky worky song was quite a feel-good song, and I see why this ended up being used in more episodes. And then what I also chuckled at was when Phineas sees Perry in agent mode, but he doesn't recognize him, and he's blinded by a different identity, and thinks he's one of the failed prototypes. Near the end of the episode, I did discover an adult joke where Ferb questions JD not wearing any clothes. Kids may not get this joke, but even at that, I kind of chuckled a bit. So, how does everyone like my new suit? Excellent Fantastic suit. Have you lost oh, weight? Oh, you look really good. You, really good. Um, that man isn't wearing any clothes. And that brings up my last cultural reference, where Ferb's comment about the CEO's lack of clothes is derived from the fairy tale The Emperor's New Clothes. Not to be confused with Disney's The Emperor's New Groove, because this story is much older than that and they don't have anything in to do with one another. But for the highlights I have, which are all regarding the main plot, speaking of the quirky worky song, my favorite moment would be the scene where the toy factory is given a makeover. When two of the workers are building the Perry in action figures, one of them questions why they have to wear those silly outfits. You know, the ones that make them look like they would be working for Santa as his elves, and the other says that he likes it because it gives him purpose, which was a great gag. I don't get why we have to wear these silly outfits. I like it. It gives me purpose. Another gag I liked in that scene was the Willy Wonka parody, where you've got Phineas in a purple suit like Willy Wonka himself, and you've got the Chocolate River, and then the Badinkadinks, the Oompa Loompa parodies, come in chanting Badinkadink as they're rowing their boat, and they declare waste on the surface dwellers. Huh? This is a toy factory. How'd this Chocolate River get here? Who the heck are you guys? We are the Badinkadinks! You set us free when you remodeled the factory. We've been trapped in the basement for years, making foam peanuts and slipping the tabs off of plastic. We will now lay waste to the surface dwellers! Okay then. And in another scene, the store manager finds Candace dressed as a platypus and says that she looks like number one, and then she breaks the fourth wall by looking directly at the camera and saying in an unenthusiastic manner, I feel like number two. And the last highlight, the ending was very funny, not only because of the simple brick jingle where they only describe it by saying it's fun, but also because of Phineas questioning anyone buying a brick for a toy with Ferb saying the brick does absolutely nothing. It's fun. Now who would buy a brick for a toy? It does absolutely nothing. As for the Perry and Doof subplot, Perry's entrance to his lair was pretty cool, where he goes over a wall of fasteners in the hardware store and pulls on a bag in the display, which then turns around, and then Perry puts his fedora on. Even his escape was very easy, where he pushes a brick to escape the brick trap because it didn't have any cement around the bricks, and when Doofenshmirtz claimed that Perry couldn't stop him with a billion Perry the Platypuses, it was as if Perry would clone himself, but the actual context of the joke is that he falls into a box of Perry in action figures being shipped, and that's why he said a billion Perry the Platypuses. <laughs> you can't stop me, Perry the Platypus! You couldn't stop me with a billion Perry 
the platypuses! Because I am unstoppable! <laughs> Finally, I lost you, Perry the platypus. I am free of you! I... The one thing about this episode that kinda annoyed me a bit was that one worker who naysays the Perry in action figure, and it kinda makes sense that JD fired him. Before I hurt Are you all crazy? It's just a thick, stupid block of wood, and it doesn't do anything! I love it! What are we talking about? I already said in the last segment that this episode was animated by Rough Draft Korea, so I'll just talk about the animation itself. Like in the last segment, it is still decent with some smooth 24 frames per second moments at times, especially during the Shimmy Jimmy commercial, and good squash and stretch for the over-the-top moments. In addition, I like the use of motion strokes when the characters and objects move rapidly, as well as the silhouettes when Perry chases Dr. Doofenshmirtz on the rooftop. Plus, the makeover factory looks really colorful, giving me all those Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory vibes. But like in the other segment, I did notice some sometimes stiff parts, such as when the worker I was talking about earlier demands a fresh new toy, and the walking movements can sometimes look weird, plus it felt a little bit off when Perry would push through the brick surrounding in which he was trapped, and his left arm stretched a little too long. That's the one part that felt off to me. As for the other animation errors, there weren't that many for me to find. The only other two I spotted are that all the Perry in action figures in the Hardy Hard toy shop had their face in the bottom and are sitting upright, which is different from the advertisement, and Perry's tail is outlined in black for most of the episode. I don't really have a problem with that sometimes, considering that I usually outline my fan art in black, mostly because I hadn't gotten too much experience with color outlines on the characters. But like the previous segment, it isn't the greatest, but it's still a highly enjoyable episode with a lot of great laughs. Okay, now before I close things out for this episode, when it comes to talking about Phineas and Ferb, we always have to talk about the one important thing to end it off, the credit sequences. Now, when Jerk the Soleil was aired on its own, the credit sequence for that was the last verse of Evil Boys, but in the credit sequence of Toy to the World, after the Brick commercial plays, we go over to the Hardy Heart Store, where many kids are buying these bricks, and Candace is now wearing a brick costume to promote the toy line, feeling rather embarrassed and a little self-conscious and arrogant, and thinking that if Jeremy saw her in that outfit, she would look ridiculous. But then Jeremy comes over and talks to Candace about the ridiculous things that they make their employees wear sometimes, such as his weenie hat, and on that note, Candace feels happier that he understands her, and then we hear the brick jingle one last time over the logos, thus finishing off the entire episode. I thought this was a nice credit sequence, and I even felt for Candace in this part, especially when she said that now Jeremy understands her. There isn't very much to it, but it's still a solid way to cap this episode off. Now, alright, so with that said and done, let's go right into the roller coaster rating. I'm gonna give Jerk the Soleil 8.5 Wild Parsnip Free Dufelium Free Roller Coasters out of 10 because it is very solid throughout, I really enjoyed the song, and it would have been nice for me to see Django spending more time with the brothers in more episodes, along with the rest of their friends, all despite having a few issues here and there. And then I give Toy to the World pretty much the same, 8.5 roller coasters full of platypus and action figures out of 10. Even if it has a few minor issues, it's also a solid, enjoyable, fun episode that has a lot of good humor and a lot of color to it. So in all, I give this episode in its entirety a very solid 8.5 roller coasters out of 10, and while it may not be perfect, this is an episode I'll likely go back to, especially for Django being one of the main kids in the first segment. So in the end, it's a very nice episode. And now let's turn over to the Twitter poll results of the last episode. And to read it all out, here's our reporter. 
Hello listeners, this is your reporter here once again, and here are the results of last episode's poll. We asked our listeners, which animal themed villain from episode 5 do you prefer? Hashtag Hamster and Gretel, hashtag Danville Discussion Poll. The choices were A. Copycat or B. Knife Slayer. 23% preferred the Knife Slayer and 77% preferred Copycat, so that's the winner. But I hope I don't get hit with his sticky hairballs. That would not be good and I'd be stuck in this office forever. There were 13 votes in total. Now back to the main studio with Caleb. This is the reporter signing out. Thanks, reporter. But what about me? Which of those two villains do I prefer? Honestly, while I do like the Nayslayer, I think I lean more towards Copycat. Like, not only is he a little funnier, But he's also got this cool costume that comes with a hairball shooter and Doc Ock tentacle arms that he wears on his back. Like, all his gadgets are really nice, especially the fact that he can reload his hairballs by simply stealing another cat and using all its fur. Plus, I love his backstory on how he became too inspired by comic books by ripping his man-cat persona off of the Bull Boy comics. While Nayslayer, on the other hand, is only a decent villain. Not as great as Copycat, but he's still fine as is with his horse punch and his design. But I think the best part about him would be his rap battle with Gretel. So overall, I think Copycat is my favorite. Alright, but now let's get on to our new Danville discussion poll for this week. And for this week, I don't know if I really wanted to do a question like this, but the question I went with is, other than hashtag Phineas and Ferb, which of these is your favorite Dan Povenmire cartoon? Hashtag Danville Discussion Poll. So here we have A. Take Two with Phineas and Ferb, even if it is a short form offshoot of the main show with live action guests. B. Milo Murphy's Law. Or C. Hamster and Gretel. So those are the three that you get to pick one of. Now, we'll see who wins, even if I know that one of them is going to be picked the very last, but let me know what you think. Go to Twitter and search for my alternate page at CalebThePNFGuy or hashtag Danville Discussion Poll to make your voice heard on which of those other shows is your favorite. But finally, before I end things off for today, I have a news update to cover here. Of course, in recent news, I've seen some news stories spreading around the public that Jeff Swappy Marsh was confirmed to return working on the Phineas and Ferb revival and voicing Major Monogram, and I am happy with this, but that's not what I'm here to talk about since I already said my fill on that in the last episode. The big news is for those of you in the U.S. that have access to Disney Channel but don't have Disney+, Plus, Phineas and Ferb the movie Candace Against the Universe will be making its cable premiere on Disney Channel on Saturday, April 8th at 8 p.m. Eastern Pacific, followed by the hour-long series finale of The Owl House at about 9.25 p.m. Eastern Pacific. And I gotta say, finally, it's about time this movie expanded its distribution from just Disney+, Plus, especially with Disney's current tradition with stuff like Zombies 3, Monsters at Work, The Proud Family, Louder and Prouder, Chippendale Park Life, even The Mandalorian. And the fact that it's coming before the moment the Owl House ends is just an added bonus because I love both Candace Against the Universe and the Owl House, and I ain't ready to say a goodbye to the latter. I just ain't. The same thing happened to me with the Amphibia finale last year, so maybe it'll get me in tears again with that. <laughs> but yeah, with Candace Against the Universe, I bet this is going to give American viewers without Disney Plus the opportunity to set their DVR to record the movie when they can't afford Disney Plus, which is a good thing too. 
Plus, it's giving me some hope that, especially because Disney CEO Bob Iger has set a new plan for home media where they put more emphasis on releasing more of their movies and maybe even TV series on DVD, Blu-ray, and 4K Blu-ray like they've done in the past, that they even release more of their Disney Plus titles on those formats, Candace Against the Universe included, maybe even as part of a complete original series set of Phineas and Ferb. Heck, I'm even hoping that they release those titles on digital formats as well, such as iTunes, because we all need to balance home media and streaming at once so that we can preserve everything we enjoy in entertainment in our hands forever, even if Disney Plus has rarely ever removed some of their content as much as Netflix and even worse, HBO Max. This is why I have stuff like The Mitchells vs. The Machines on Blu-ray and the original Proud Family on DVD. That way I don't have to stream them on Netflix or Disney Plus respectively. So I would also love for all the currently released Phineas and Ferb content to have a full physical release as well, with both movies, including Across the Second Dimension and Candace Against the Universe and the Take 2 shorts. But anyways, if you're a Phineas and Ferb fan who's in the US and you don't have Disney+, Plus, then be sure to catch and or DVR record the Candace Against the Universe movie when it airs on Saturday, April 8th at 8pm Eastern Pacific, followed by the Owl House series finale watching and dreaming at around 9.25 to 9.30pm Eastern Pacific, only on Disney Channel. And that is all that I've got to talk about this week. Thank you guys for listening to this episode of the Danville Discussion. As for me, you can find me on my Facebook page at Real Caleb Dirksen, on my Twitter, Tumblr, and TikTok pages at Caleb Dirksen 2 with the number 2 at the end, on my alternate Twitter page at Caleb the PNF Guy, on my Instagram pages at Caleb.Dirksen for my main page or at Caleb Flynn Fletcher for my alternate page and on my DeviantArt page at CalebDirksen20. You can also find me on Discord by entering the username CalebDirksen, that's in two words, and then the code number 4600. And if you go to the invite link in the description below, it'll also invite you to my Discord server so that you can talk with me about anything, including this podcast or my other content. You can also find me on YouTube, just search for Caleb Dirksen and look for the icon of me as a soldier. As for this podcast, we are available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Amazon Music, Audible, Good Pods, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and we are now also available on iHeartRadio. That's right, we have expanded our podcast to another service. If you're on the web, all you have to do is either search on iHeartRadio for the Danville discussion or type in the address at www.iheart.com slash podcast slash and then keep typing in there by following it all with the show ID number 9971060707 all in the address bar. That's www.iheart.com slash podcast slash 9971060607 and it should take you to the official Danville Discussion page on iHeartRadio and then you can subscribe over there. Plus, since Anchor is now Spotify for podcasters, the link to the Danville Discussion website has been redirected to podcasters.spotify.com slash show slash pod slash Caleb Dash Dirksen, so try going over to that link and it'll take you directly to the Danville Discussion page. If you have listened to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast service you use, uh, do you mind do you mind just going out to just rate and review this show? That would be very nice of you, but only if you're being respectful. And if you have listened to this episode as a video on YouTube, then press that like button and leave us a little comment with your thoughts on this episode of Phineas and Ferb. You can also share your feedback or ask some questions by sending us an email at danvildiscussion at gmail.com with the series and episode title in the subject line. Join us next time, and I'm going to delve into episode 6 of Hamster and Gretel, which has Saturday Homecoming Fever and Dr. Eel Good. Thank you guys so much for listening to this show, and tune in next time for the newest episode of the Danville Discussion with all about Phineas and Ferb and beyond. So on that note, this is Caleb, over and out.
This podcast was created strictly and only for entertainment and information purposes. It is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company, Disney Television Animation, or their affiliates. All and any names, images, clips, sounds, or other items related to Phineas and Ferb, Milo Murphy's Law, Hamster and Gretel, and other Disney properties are trademarks and or copyrights of their respective holders. All original content from this podcast is the intellectual property of the Danville discussion and the host or hosts running the podcast unless otherwise noted. It's fun. Now who would buy a brick for a toy? It does absolutely nothing. Yeah.